Hi, Bailey. How are you? How's school? Thumbs up. Good deal. Hey, I want to welcome you guys to church this morning. Uh, if you got something out of revival, if you, if you, if the Lord spoke to you, can you say amen this morning? Amen. Revival was a very special time. A special time of being renewed, of spending a little bit time, more time. We had some great preaching. Uh, we had some good music. And the Lord really helped us. Um, and I'm praying, and even today is a continuation of largely what the conversation of revival was about. So I'm praying that, that our hearts are still open. We're still ready to receive what, what the Lord wants to wants to say to us as individuals and as a church. Uh, so I hope you're ready this morning. Hope you're ready to worship. Hope you're ready to, to speak to the Lord, to hear from him this morning, because uh, he's got stuff to say to us. We're going to have some announcements, and then we'll get started. Welcome to church. <laughs> I wanted to let you know about a great support group called While You Are Waiting. It's for parents grieving the loss of a child of any age, and they offer the hope of Jesus during these meetings. The next one is meeting here at Grace, Sunday the 13th of November at 6 o'clock. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Joe or Christy Slate, or if you know somebody who is grieving the loss of a child of any age, please uh, hook them up with this group, and they'll get a little bit of help from some people who are walking this road and some help from Jesus and his word at the same time. Thank you. So over the last few weeks, we've been collecting uh, stuff for food boxes for Thanksgiving for our friends at Lincoln Homes. We've collected macaroni and cheese and stuffing and canned vegetables and cranberry sauce. Over these next couple of weeks, we'll be collecting cake mixes and frosting cans plus... On the 13th and on the 20th, if you have coats, jackets, sweatshirts, long johns, long sleeve shirts that you're not using, or if you'd like to go shopping for some of those items and bring them in, we're going to be taking those down around Thanksgiving as well. It's starting to get cold. Let's help out our neighbors. Thank you. A couple other announcements that I want to make you aware of. On the 8th of November, this building will be closed because of elections, so no access to the buildings that day. If you haven't checked out the Ocadres ministry, really anybody can go. They meet Thursdays at Mission Barbecue uh, at 12 o'clock, and the Prime Timers have an event coming up in November. If you have any questions about that, see Trudy or Chuck Wyatt. to be together. God, you, you, you designed all this so we could gather and be together um, every, every week. And God, so would you bless us this morning, God? Would you help your people not just to worship you, God, but to hear from you this morning, God? Um, everything we're doing uh, in this place, God, is formative. So help us, Jesus. Bind us together. Put us on mission, Lord. Speak to your people who are listening this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship. <coughs>
Praise the Lord. Will you guys stand? Let's keep singing to the Lord this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given in due. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Thank you, Jesus. The moment that Jesus intersects with your life, that is the moment when life really begins. He reached all of us. He wants to reach all of us into our hearts, into our very persons. Change us into new creations. Lord, will you help us this morning, God, to see you clearly. We want to worship you, Jesus, in spirit and truth. And God, today is... 
today is another opportunity to do that. Help your people, Jesus. Praise him this morning. Thank you, Lord.
with me. Let's pray together this morning. God, none of us in here knows what that what that scene is going to be like. None of us knows what ho- ho- heaven looks like. None of us knows what that moment of being in your presence and being in your glory really looks like. The writers in the New Testament do their best um, to, to describe that, but it's wholly inadequate. But God, one day we will gather at your feet and we will give you praise and it will be good. The very best description that we might try and attempt to, uh, to convey what it will be like to be in the presence of God and to give him praise and to lift up Jesus. It's so inadequate, but God, what a day it will be. And we don't have to just sit around and pine for some day. We get to practice today. We get to practice as we gather uh, in the church. We get to practice as we sing and we lift up uh, your, your name. We get to practice bringing the kingdom to Clarksville in every interaction, every day as we run across people 
who are in need of Jesus. We are the conveyors. We, your church, sons and daughters of God, we get to go out and love people like you love them and bring good news and bring hope and bring joy and bring the kingdom. We get to do that. Praise your holy name. God, thank you for the church. Thank you for this church, all the other churches around Clarksville, all the other churches around the world today as your people gather on the Lord's Day. God, we thank you for the gift of the church. And we have needs, we have burdens, specific folks that we want to pray for today. We continue to pray for Jeff Magnuson's mother who has struggled um, in her battle with cancer. God, we pray for Janice that you would touch her. Be with Jeff, be with Kelly as they care for her. God, touch Janice she, as she heads back back to the doctor and more treatments. Lord, we pray that you would touch. God, we pray for Dwayne and Melanie Harris. Dwayne was here Wednesday night. Melanie was with him and they brought good news for our revival service. She has battled cancer these last four years and did not get good news from the doctor on Friday. We pray, God, for Melanie, that you would touch her and help her. God, be with Dwayne and be with the Hendersonville Church. Lord, we continue to pray for Sean as he's recovering from surgery, for Janetta Houston as she's uh, still in the hospital this morning. God, we pray your, your helping hand on her. Lord, as, as hope Hopefully she is coming out of the hospital, wants to be at home. Lord, get her to the place that she needs to be. God, continue to touch Ginger Barnett and Jim Hammonds. Lord, be with Gloria Hodges as she's got treatments out in front of her. Faye Guthrie as she has a pacemaker procedure out in front of her. Be with Clay Smith as hopefully his last surgery is right around the corner. Be with the long breaks who are traveling today. All the other needs, God, that our congregation represents. Thank you for the good things that you have given us. Thank you for our blessings. Thank you, God, that you have given your people from the newest Christian to the person who has walked with you for the longest in this body, for those that have the most and those that have the least. God, you have blessed us, not just so we would be blessed, but so that we would be a blessing to this world. Remind us of that. Convince us of that. Don't let us let go of that truth. Speak to our hearts this morning. God, we praise your name for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you're going to do. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you're sitting down, would you stand back up? You might think I'm going to make you shake hands with somebody. I'm not. <laughs> Yet. We are going to confess our faith this morning. In second service, we're going to baptize two young people, and they're going to be in here, and we're going to confess our faith this morning. We're going to say the Apostles' Creed, but a lot of you will not be here for second service, so I want to do that now. Let's confess our faith this morning. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the grave, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That's what we believe. Praise God. Would you turn around, find somebody that you don't know very well and re, 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 reintroduce yourself to them.
right, all right. I'm glad you're here this morning. Wanted to thank you. Um, a couple of different uh, thank yous. First of all, if this is your first time here this morning, howdy. My name's Rich. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad that you're here. Hope that you come back like a thousand more times. Um, we will be back next week. If you have a home church, God bless you in your home church. But if you don't have a place that you attend regularly, a place that's home, we'd love for you to keep on coming here. Last night, we had um, our Trunk or Treat event, and we had hundreds of families come through. We had lots of folks through the property last night. Lots of tooth decay will be put at at our feet. And so uh, we just had chances to be good to our neighbors and to plant seeds that hopefully one of these days, if a, if a family comes to our property for an event like last night and does not have a church home, they might not ever come. Do you know that, right? Okay, we're not just doing this simply for outreach. We want people to come. But there may be a day that, had, that they have great need. And because they don't have a body of believers, a church home, bing, the light bulb goes on and they think there was that one place that was good to me and my family. And God might bring them. So that's one of the reasons we do that. So thank you to everybody that took part in that. That is a Pastor Rochelle. She carries the load for that. So when you see her, give her a big, huge, huge, huge hug. Um, we had revival services this last week. I had five of my friends come in and preach five different times. And uh, many of you were there. want to thank you for your investment uh, in revival. And it was a great week. Let me remind you that over the next couple of weeks, we'll be collecting cake mixes and cans of frosting. So we're collecting, you know, good for you green beans, then yummy for you cans of uh, frosting and cake mixes. We're going to box all these things up and uh, share them with our neighbors uh, at uh, Thanksgiving. Two weeks from right now, we'll have two weeks of a coat drive. So if you have coats, jackets, sweatshirts, long sleeve shirts that are either new or, hear me, gently used, not like falling apart, gently used. Uh, we're going to have folks in our town that are going to be cold this winter. We want to love on them. Um, also, let me remind you, I'm not sure we've ever really talked about it. Have you guys noticed back here between the bathroom doors, there's a table with lots of little crafty, crafty items? Okay. So we have people in our church that make things. And we have a craft uh, table out there. And those things are for sale. Uh, you can take them and give a gift. You can put your gift in the offering box on the back wall. And Paula has led that charge. And it's for money for the Taflingers who are in Saipan serving as missionaries in the Church of the Nazarene. She told me the other day, do you know that she's raised over a thousand dollars? Just, and that was just her just bing idea one day. You know what? I make stuff like crochet or whatever. I make stuff. Maybe somebody would like to purchase some and maybe I could help the Taflingers in that. That's what that table is for. So I'd invite you to go back there and uh, look at that. We're going to receive an offering this morning and uh, it just would be a good reminder as we prepare for the offering that we have a, we call it benevolence. That's a fancy schmancy 10 cent word for we give to those who have need. And if you would just ever like to, um, uh, in addition to your offering, if you would just like to ever give for those specific immediate needs that pop up periodically in the life of the church, hungry people who need food, um, people who just have needs, and those, those situations pop up, you can give. You can give on the app. You can give here in the offering. Just mark that benevolence. If you need to know how to spell benevolence, ask somebody smarter than me because I always miss spell benevolence. Special needs, maybe. That's good. But you can give toward that. Let me, let me pray for our offering. Lord, thank you for a church that loves you. Help us to love each other. Help us to love the unlovable. Because at different times in our lives, we've all been unlovable. Thank you, God, that people have loved me when I was unlovable. 
Help us, Lord, to love those that you love, and that's everybody. So, God, would you be glorified in our offering this morning as we bring back to you a portion of what belongs to you already. You've entrusted it to us as stewards. God, bless it, multiply it, and bring your kingdom here to Clarksville and around the world. In your great name we pray. Amen. Amen. So he was a homeless man. He was um, new to town. A lot of you who maybe have dealt with homeless uh, people and folks before you've met them, you 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 uh, you meet them once, or or you stop long enough to hear their story. A lot of a lot of homeless folks aren't from a town where you meet them. They are traveling. They're from going from point A to point B. And this particular homeless man was new to town. And he had just been in town a few days. He had gone the places where homeless folks go under bridges and in abandoned lots. And he had looked for places to get food and he had looked for places to be out of the elements. And he found himself um, uh, back behind a tree on a church property. And uh, he had been there a few days and then it was Sunday morning. And the people, the good, the good Sunday morning people gathered for church. And there's this homeless guy on the property. And, um, and you wonder what's, what's going to happen. You know, who is it that, you know, that lifts up their britches and gets rid of that riffraff? And who's going to be, you know, the really nicey nice person and go out and love on this person? Well, there, there were... 10, 15, 20 people that actually went over to the tree where the man was sitting at the bottom of this tree trunk and they went over and said, is there anything we can do? Do you need some water? Do you need some food? And uh, there were people that went over, but many didn't. They saw him, parked their car, saw him, and then just went on into church. You know where I'm headed with this? He was the new pastor of the church. Do you know that that story has been told many, many times? Do you know that story happened here in Clarksville in 2013? Sango United Methodist Pastor Willie got to church. Got to, he was appointed to his new church. He decided to get to town early. He lived as a homeless man for a week and parked himself under the tree on the property on the first Sunday. And he got up and he preached. To these fine folks and while he was preaching you know he had a big old burly coat on his hair was all nasty and matted his beard was grown out and as he preached he shed those layers and he combed his hair and he looked far more respectable and everybody who hadn't stopped thought oh my gosh that's the new preacher and everybody who had stopped were so thankful that they had because they probably knew where he was headed. He was headed to Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Luke chapter 10. Let me read you a story this morning that Jesus shared with his followers. And I want you to hear with fresh ears today. And we're actually going to be in this same story this week and next week. And we're going to talk about different characters this week than we'll talk about next week. But each one of these characters, in fact, we won't talk about a couple of them, but each one of these characters is important. And what I want us to focus on this morning is maybe something that we haven't really focused on before. If you'd like to, you can stand in honor of God's word this morning. We're in Luke chapter 10. 
starting in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law, that would be the religious Jewish law, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. That's an important word there, test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? Jesus, uh, the man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this. Good stuff. Do this and you will live. But he, the expert in religious Jewish law. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus told a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. And so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and when he, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, the Samaritan took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus asks, Which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, Go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So let me give you the setting. Um, if you know your geography in and around Jerusalem, Jerusalem uh, is uh, above sea level. Jericho is down below sea level. It's about 3,500-ish feet of a drop in elevation from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's through hills, through craggy mountains, through gullies and ravines, lots of cutbacks and switchbacks, and it's about a 20-mile walk. And anybody who walked this road alone was, the, the Greek word would be idiot. Nobody did this. If you had any money in your pockets, you would not do this. If you were a traveler or a trader, you would not do this. You either went with an armed escort or you went in a caravan with a group of people. Jesus tells this story this way on purpose. The people listening to Jesus and the man who Jesus was talking to would have said, what kind of Yahoo goes out unattended, walking through those dangerous roads? It was well known. You didn't walk this road by yourself. Deep in the days following Jesus, in the centuries following Jesus, it wasn't Jesus didn't make up this dangerous road. It was called the Red Way or the Bloody Way, this road from Jerusalem to Jericho. You just didn't go this way. And Jesus is telling this story for a reason. And over the next couple of weeks, I want us to get some context. Why is Jesus telling this story? Well, we're not even going to talk about the robbers. The robbers come, they beat this man to a bloody pulp, and they leave him in the ditch. They take what was his for themselves. I would say this, the robbers are coming from this mentality. What's yours is mine. Kim Slight was next to me last night, and she had her, uh, she had her uh, candy bucket right next to her. And she wasn't paying attention. I just reached over and grabbed a handful of her candy, as, just as a joke. And she's a nice lady. She said, no, you go ahead and keep it. You go ahead and keep it. I, I, wasn't, I was doing it just to bother her because I was, I don't know, bored for a second or whatever. But I just reached over, and I grabbed some of her candy. What's yours is mine. And that's where the, 
That's where the robbers are coming from. They would hide out in those ravines, high walls, rocky crags that you could come behind, you could hide, or even better yet, leave a stooge out on the road. Oh, we're so hurt. Uh, please come and take care of me. And then when you stopped, ah, they'd pounce on you. All right? It was a well-known trick. You would not walk this way by yourself. You would not go without a big group. You would not go without an armed escort. And Jesus tells a story about a man who did just that, and predictably, he was beaten and left half dead. Then come the two religious types. And I don't like this story because we here on Sunday morning, we kind of are the religious types. So there's the priest, the man who was in charge of going into the synagogue, going into the tabernacle, into the temple, and making sacrifices on behalf of the people. The priest walks along, and then the Levite walks along. The Levite was one of the other workers in the tabernacle, workers in the temple, who was responsible for the religious activity that went on in the Jewish culture. And Jesus tells this story, the priest sees the man, walks on by. The Levite sees the man and walks on by. Why? Well, there's actually a pretty good explanation for it. Did you know that? They weren't just horrible, callous, I don't care about such fools people. In Jewish custom, if you were the priest, if you worked in the temple, you could not touch anything that was bleeding. It would make you ceremonially unclean. You couldn't do your job if you had touched blood, if you had touched a dead thing, dead animal, dead person outside of the acts uh, that you do for worship in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle, you were unclean. So these guys were actually technically obeying the law. I couldn't go over and help this bloody dying man. First of all, he might be dead, and if I touched him and, and, and got over there near him, I would be unclean. I couldn't do my job. If he's bleeding, you know, he's probably going to die anyway. And, you know, if I get over there and I get blood on me, and I'm just going to be unclean and I can't do my job. So they just keep on going on. If the robbers are coming from the standpoint of what's yours is mine and I'm going to take it, the priest and the Levite are coming from a standpoint that I would think of along, along this line. What's mine is mine. And if I stop and help you, then something bad's going to happen to me. If I stop and help you and you're bleeding and I touch you, I can't then go and do my job at the temple. What does that look like today? Well, we see somebody who is hurting. We see somebody who has need. If I do something, if I give this homeless person $10, what? I'm going to have 10 less dollars. You parents who have kids at home right now with buckets of candy, try this one. You know kind of a Milky Way guy myself. You have a Milky Way. How about helping out dad with a Milky Way? Your kid's going to eyeball you most likely and think, I have eight Milky Ways. If I give you one of my Milky Ways, I will only have seven Milky Ways. And then the end of the world is going to be upon us. What's mine is mine. We, I've, I've searched for a better word because I wanted a better word than this word and I couldn't come up with a better word. So my word this morning is selfish. What's mine is mine. The priest and the Levite, they weren't just calloused, didn't care at all. But if I stop and help, then what will happen to me? So they were more focused on what would happen to them than what had happened or would happen with the robber. And folks, before we look down our Sunday morning righteous noses at them, how often do we do that? Right down till 2013 at Sango United Methodist, Pastor Willie 
outside, on the property, under the tree. Some folks stopped and went and wanted to minister, but many didn't. If I stop, it'll cost me. If I do X, something good, insert your own predicament here. If I do X, something good, then Y, I'll be at a loss. If I stop and take the time, I really don't have time right now. If I give this money, I really don't have money to spare right now. If I get involved in this, oh, you know that he is always about the drama, and I can't handle any more drama in my life right now. I'm glad that Jesus stopped for my drama, but that's just me. If our focus... If our focus, if our religion, think priest and Levite, if our religion is about self, is it about our refusal to mix with the unclean in this world? If our religion, if our focus is about separation in this world, if our, if our religion causes us to pass by much of the world that's half dead alongside the road, then folks, that is not the kingdom to which Jesus calls us. Self, self, selfish. Me, mine, me, my, me, mine, mine, I, me. Jesus talked about this all the time. Matthew Chapter 19, the rich young ruler, he comes and says, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be what I've created you to be, go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. In Luke chapter 12, the rich fool, remember that guy? The parable of the rich fool. A man has an abundant harvest and he's got barns and now he's got more harvest than his barns can handle. He says, what will I do? I've got all this harvest. I know I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones and I'll fill them and then I'll have enough forever. I will eat, drink and be merry. And Jesus tells the story and he says, dude died that night and never got to enjoy any of what he had gathered gathered for him self in Luke chapter 16 the parable of the rich man and Lazarus it's about a very very rich man who lives in a house dressed in purple which is code word in New Testament times for bougie Nobody wore purple except for those who had a ton of money. And a very, very poor man named Lazarus who sat at the rich man's gate and they both die. And every time, including me, a preacher reads from Luke chapter 16, all we want to do is describe hell. And I believe maybe Jesus is teaching us a lesson and he's saying, this is what selfishness looks like. This man had everything. He had plenty and every day he walked past poor Lazarus. Lazarus dies and goes to eternal reward. The rich man dies and goes to judgment. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Philippians Two, don't just look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Second Timothy 3, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. John in 1 John 3 says, if anyone has the world's good and sees a brother in need, go and give. 1 Corinthians 10, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. I rip off Joe way more than I tell you people. But Joe gave me some thoughts this week. We can't be a good neighbor from our side of the road. See, that's the rich man in Lazarus. From his vantage point on the inside of his wonderful opulent house, he could really operate without interacting with poor Lazarus. And the priest and the Levite didn't have to deal with the with the poor man that had been robbed on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. They just stayed in their lane. We can't be the good neighbor that Jesus calls us to be on our side of the road. And we spend way too much time just walking by. And being the hands and feet of Jesus means getting involved. So as I've preached this, and as I've thought about it this week, I've thought about a lot about me. Boy, that doesn't sound good, does it? I've thought a lot about me. I'm preaching on selfishness, me, mine, mine. Okay, but, but I've, how did, what does this mean to, for me? 
sometimes, every now and then, I'll do the right thing. Sometimes. I don't always do it for the right reason. I do it because it's the right thing to do, and I, I've got to do the right thing. And I don't, always, I don't always respond as the Samaritan did. But sometimes when I respond as the Samaritan did, I do it because it's the right thing, not necessarily because I have the love of Jesus that compels me to go. There are people in our church family that have love that exudes from them. I want to be like that. I'm, I'm closer than I used to be, but I'm not quite there yet. What would it look like if I truly listened to Jesus and if I went out of my way? Well, if I give this, then this bad will happen. If I give a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, if I give this, then I'll have need. If I get involved in this situation, I might not ever get out of it. If I respond to this hurting person, then, oh, they're never going to leave me alone. If I do this, then this will happen to me, if I truly brought the kingdom like Jesus is teaching us to, it will cost us something. That's what Jesus is saying. What would it look like if I got my act together? Then, I brought you people into the equation. What would it look like if this church truly was a good Samaritan church? Do you know that churches... There are churches, not you guys. Other churches, not us. Other, other people. Did you know that there are churches that are priest and Levite churches? All they do is focus on themselves. Well, we don't want to change our music styles. We don't want to sing that, you know, weirdo hippie drums music because then the riffraff might come around here. We, we like what we like when we like it. Well, we, we, we don't want to open up our doors to those outside groups that might come in. They might, they might, you know, leave stains around the place, and they might fill the trash buckets up and not empty them out, and they might leave stains on the carpet, and we don't want to do that. Well, we don't want to give to this situation in town because we don't know how they're spending their... We're not in control of how they spend. They might spend that money in a way that we might not want to. It's just better for us to do our own thing. Well, we've got this extra money now. What are we going to do? Well, you know, we, we, we've really been thinking about doing this new thing for our church. There are churches that can be priest and Levite churches. There are churches that can be very self-centered, selfish, me, my, mine. Then, there are wonderful places, bodies of Christ, that are constantly on the lookout for those that are broken and bleeding and bloodied and abandoned at the side of the road, and they respond with the love of Jesus. I want to be that kind of a church. I've set you up. Did you know that just in the last four weeks we've paid our mortgage off? Do you know how much money we sent the bank every month? A lot of money. And do you know who we don't have to send money to anymore? If I knew how to dance, I'd dance right now. So what are we going to do? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about it. And we're going to give you opportunities to chime in. What do you think we should do? Some of my first thoughts are me, mine, my thoughts. We need to do this. We need to build this. We need more staff people. I'd really like a raise. That'd be awesome. And do you know, I just, we, me, my, mine. What can we do? I know. Let's build bigger barns. Let's, let's, let's add to our, let's add to our safety net. Let's, let's put away for a rainy day. You know, the, the, there is no, did you know that there's no jacuzzi in my office? What? <laughs> It's a shock. <laughs> we can think, as a church, we can think, me, my, mine. Next week, we're going to get to the hero of the story. But today, I wanted you to think about the robbers. What's yours is mine. The priest and the Levite, what's mine is mine. 
And I think we, at different times, we've probably all been there. What's mine belongs to me. I made it. I earned it. And if I let it go, I'm going to be lacking. I'm going to be less than. I'm going to be somehow hurting because I've given to someone else. We can be like that individually. We can be like that as a church. But here's your homework for next week. Reread the story, Luke chapter 10. Focus on the Samaritan. And then go and read the end of Acts chapter 2. And read about the type of church that changed the world. These followers of Jesus abandoned him at the cross. Saw the risen Jesus and still were a little doubting. <laughs> Imagine seeing Jesus dead, alive again, and still doubting. That's, that's who those guys were. Jesus appeared to 500 people at once after he rose from the dead and on the day of Pentecost, how many people were in the upper room? 120. Where were, they, where were the rest of them? They had seen a resurrected Jesus and they hadn't stuck around. The church began with 120 people and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, Peter goes out and preaches good news and thousands respond. What kind of a church changes the world. Acts chapter 2 tells you, are we going to be an Acts chapter 2 kind of a church? Or are we going to stay in our lane on the right side of the road, being religious and not be affected by those who are bloody on the wayside? Would you stand up with me? So I want to give you a chance this morning to respond in any way to what the Lord may have been saying to you. It could be that the Lord, and the Lord, you're in good company. The Lord does this to me all the time. I hear something from the Lord, and the Lord flips my ears. Okay? The Lord says, hey, wake up, knucklehead. This one's for you. And this one was for me this morning. Sometimes I accidentally do the right thing, but I want to do the right thing because of the love of Jesus compels me to do the right thing. Personally. And then as a body of Christ, I want us to do the right thing, to respond to those in need, to go to those who are hurting, to minister to those, to take people thanksgiving boxes that bless them and their family. I want to be a part of a church that loves on their neighbors, not just loving them with, with, with macaroni and cheese, but going to those who are broken and bloody. And if we minister to them, it's going to cost us. <laughs> And Jesus talks, we can get in a cycle of me, my, mine, or what Jesus teaches us here, to constantly be on the lookout for those in need. If the Lord has been talking to you this morning, would you, as we close in prayer, and as we sing, would you talk back to the Lord this morning? It could be that he's saying, this is for you. Do something with this. Respond to this. You're welcome to come. You, you can always come and pray at the altar. You can pray there where you stand. You can sit. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Jesus, we, we all need this. Even the very best of us in here who has the love of Jesus breaking out through every pore, we can... We can all be challenged by this. Some of us religious types, we might do the right thing sometimes, but we always don't do it because the, we love you and we love our neighbors. We do it because it's the right religious thing to do. God, turn our eyes away from me, my, mine, selfish, self-centered living to the many who are bleeding and bruised and broken around us. God, open our eyes to see what you see and then make our hearts more like your heart that we might love our neighbor. In your great name we pray, amen.
friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, again and again and again. what's going to have happened because you were here this morning, you heard this message? Nothing. Unless we respond to a God who lovingly is flicking your ears and saying, here's what I want you to do with this. My guess is he'll give you something to do with this. This isn't just talk. We get to bring the kingdom. Ask God to show you where he wants you to bring the kingdom in response to what he shared with us this morning. Let me bless you as you go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go with his spirit and listen to him. You're dismissed. Have a great week.